Perfect. Thank Please. you. Um, my name is Kai Bernabauer. I'm also working at the Chair of Materials Test Engineering at TU Dortmund. And today I will present about the fatigue of IC347 metastable austenitic steel and suitable NDT parameters for these kind of metastable austenites and a short time evaluation procedure that makes use of NDT parameters. My presentation is divided in uh, four parts. First, I will give a short project overview to explain our motivation and the objectives. Then I will show the fatigue testing setups and talk a little bit about the material that was used to then um, come to the results and finally give you a summary and give an outlook of where you want to go with the project. Um, the aim of the project is residual fatigue lab evaluation of components and materials for power plant applications, especially nuclear power plant applications. So for power plants, there are a lot of H components in use and it would be of great value to be able to tell, for example, this can stay in operation and this pipe must be renewed. We are especially interested in pipe components from metastable austenitic steels and we are trying to evaluate various non-destructive testing parameters um, and using those during fatigue tests to describe the microstructural aging mechanisms that occur, collect materials data, and then at a later stage transfer this onto actual components. For this, we will be able to do component testing. We will more about this later. <coughs> so the results I want to show today are all made um, from specimens from bar material. You can see the material in the top right and the chemical composition is given in the table. As you can see, the nickel content is quite low and it's also a niobium alloy grade. Um, the niobium has high affinity to carbon, so the carbon does not stay in the matrix and together with manganese, the three austenite stabilizing elements all have pretty low content. Um, this is a 30 millimeter bar and the specimen smallest diameter was 9.9 .9 millimeter, so this center region is of interest. And um, at the bottom you can see EBSD and EDX maps. Um, the EDX map uh, shows a pattern that's probably familiar with most of you. We can see uh, dendrites and interdendritic regions. The dendrites are dark and the interdendritic regions are bright. That means we have uh, higher austenite stability in the interdendritic parts and less austenite stability and therefore already a mixed um, phase region in the dendrites as you can see in the phase mapping. So take away from here in the initial state, there is already BCC, most probably alpha prime marking site. Here are the fatigue testing setups that were used on the left side for ambient conditions and on the right side for medium conditions. Um, as I said, we are trying to evaluate NDT parameters at ambient conditions. You can see the ferret scope affected the specimen. That's a commercial system that's usually used to um, evaluate the alpha prime marking site, for example, after welding processes in the industry. We also applied the DC potential probe and thermocouples. And since all the tests were done in strain control, uh, the extensometers are of importance. I used one um, small extensometer with a gauge length of 10 millimeter and also applied one at the clamping diameters with a gauge length of 88 millimeters. Both were used to um, control tests. And in the medium testing setup now, the 10 millimeter gauge length has to leave since there is a PMML cell around the specimen now. It has an inlet and an outlet for electrolyte, which is um, being temporized, so we always have fresh electrolyte around the specimen. And this allows us to have a um, standard three electrode cell. Here you can see the reference electrode, the counter electrode, and the specimen itself is the working electrode. And so we can track, for example, uh, open circuit potential um, during the test. The DC potential probe stays, and also um, at the back of a at the back of the specimen, it's a little hard to see here, there is a um, self-built sensor from, from one of the project partners which is making use of the whole effect. The strain control here has to be done with a big extensometer. Here you can see the specimen geometry. All tests were done with the servo hydraulic testing system, giving the axial load capacity of 250 kilonewtons, and as I said, in strain control with fully reverse loading. They were done with a constant strain rate because it is known that the strain rate has an influence on uh, marking cyclic transformation and therefore on the low cycle fatigue behavior. End of test was at 200,000 cycles, so we are looking at the low cycle fatigue behavior or at 50% load drop. Here you can see a test result from the medium testing setup. The control was done with the 10 millimeter, so the small gauge length um, extensometer. And we can see that upwards of uh, um, strain amplitude of 0.3%, 
the stress amplitude starts to increase sharply. This is the pronounced strain hardening behavior, which is quite well known. And four of these tests were done, two with the 10 millimeter gauge length and two with the 88 millimeter gauge length. The measured strains or the controlled strains were correlated to enable the test in the medium. Um, here you can see the same test, but with a correlated strain amplitude, so 88 millimeter extensor needle. The mechanical parameters show very similar behavior as they should. The stress amplitude starts to increase sharply upwards of strains of like 0.3%. We can see that the whole voltage also starts to increase as at the same time as the increase of the stress amplitude. We can expect that a magnetic measurement, of course, gives us a better signal when we have more ferromagnetic phase content. Now it appears like that the signal from the whole voltage gets noisier as the test goes on. This is not actually the case, but instead, when the specimen moves into a uh, tension region, the whole voltage also goes up, and when the specimen moves back into compression, the whole voltage goes down. So it shows the same triangular form that you have at constant strain rate loading. The same can be said about the open circuit potential in the beginning. It uh, looks thin and then it appears like it's getting noisier, but it's the same kind of effect I will show it later. Also, what I would like to note is that the open circuit potential shows this uh, sharp drop at the same time like the stress amplitude. Um, as the crack propagates, a um, new free surface is created, and that means that the potential of the osmetic steel uh, goes to more anodic values. So this can be used quite well to, to um, look at crack in initi initiation. <coughs> Additionally, to the strain increase test, I would like to show two constant amplitude tests. Same uh, NDT, NDT parameters are shown. The open circuit potential also shows this, uh, this sharp drop when the crack starts to propagate. And also, as we can probably expect, at high 0.8 here um, strain amplitude, we get to higher levels in the whole voltage about 16.5 millivolts and at the top it reaches saturation faster. Same for stress amplitude, only like 500 megapascals compared to 800 megapascals at 0.8 percent. Here are two EBSD mappings from uh, specimen cross-sections uh, post-test at uh, 0.25, so very low plastic strain. We basically do not have any Martin City transformation. It was only quantified as 5 percent more as an initial state, but of course this can be due to the cutout. I think this map is quite, quite nice. We can see that a, a, a dendrite has been uh, fully transformed into um, alpha prime martensite. And um, yeah. <coughs> now with the three tests that I showed to you, it is possible to do this fatigue life calculation by means of a short time evaluation procedure. For this, we start uh, plotting the total strain amplitude over time and the material response. Now the, the material response, it can be the mechanical values or the stress amplitude but we've also used the whole voltage. If we then plot that response over the total strain amplitude, divide it into a mostly elastic and mostly plastic part, we can get the uh, small n exponents. And with those, we go into the um, empiric, relation, empiric equations by Mo and get the fatigue ductility and fatigue strength exponents. Taking the two constant amplitude tests that I showed to you, as the name says, constant amplitude, we can calculate the plastic strain amplitude. Since they are additive, we now have plastic and elastic strain amplitude. At half of n fracture, we take those. It's logarithmic, but it's half of n fracture. We take those and go into bus turn and Manson coffin. And under the assumption that um, elastic and plastic as n line are additive, we can now plot the whole diagram. Now, here you can see the results the more conventional way from stress amplitude and from the whole voltage signal that was shown earlier. Um, it's quite nice that they are in good agreement. We believe this is a nice result, and they also fit well to the constant amplitudes tests that were done so far. Where do we want to move on? Uh, first, I want to summarize. So I showed you the whole voltage parameter and how we can use it and do a short-time evaluation procedure with the, with the help of it. And we would like to transfer the strain life method onto more parameters because more NDT parameters might be sensible for different microstructural changes. This data is also from the same strain increase test. In uh, the, the, the black line is at 0.6%, the red one 0.4%, and the blue one 
And here you can see what I tried to explain earlier, that the amplitude of those signals moves quite well along with the mechanical loading of the specimen. And this might be much better suited to do a fatigue life calculation because we do not have this drift that we saw in the, in the plots earlier. <coughs> All those systems will then be um, moved to one of my project partners where we will be able to put a pipe that was originally manufactured for use in a nuclear power plant in a hot water circuit. There we can reach pressures of 80 bar and 300 degrees C. And we will try to evaluate how we can transfer our results onto component residual fatigue life. Here are some reference publications. You can find them on our website. And with this, I want to thank for funding and acknowledge funding by the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them now, or you can contact me later. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs>